Welcome back to our class on machine translation. Today we're going to talk about decoding for neural machine translation models. Uh, you might recall that we already had a lecture on decoding for statistical machine translation. So a lot of the principles that we established then still apply here, um, but there are some important differences and uh, this lecture also going to cover a lot of other aspects of decoding. So. Um, in machine learning, the task we're dealing here with right now is also called inference. So the task is if you have a trained model and you now want to translate test sentences, you basically have to come up with the output for that. So you have to infer what the translation for that test sentence is. Um, viewing it in the context of computation graphs, uh, we basically just need to execute the forward step in the computation graph. Although it is different from the forward step in the computation graph for training, because the training time, we know the reference translation, so we can build a graph with the correct translation and space in place. While here, we basically have to predict various possibilities, how long the sentence will be, how many words we produce, which words we produce. That makes it actually a bit more difficult. Um, I'm showing here just highlighting part of um, a neural machine translation model that makes the prediction. So the way we uh, formalize this is by having part of the model called the decoder and the central part in that is the decoder state. So this is a recurrent state that uh, makes one word prediction after the other. And the word prediction is happening here. So it is informed by the input context that goes in there, by the recurrent neural network state, and also by the embedding of the previously produced output word. So these are the three inputs to it to make a prediction. Um, so these are three vectors that go in, uh, and then there might be any kind of calculation, it doesn't really matter at this point what it is. And it has then a prediction over the output vocabulary, where each word in the output vocabulary is given a number. And uh, since we apply the softmax as the final activation function there, that number is, uh, all the numbers for all the different words add up to one. And each number is between zero and one, so it is a probability distribution. Um, so what we have to do then is we have to pick a word from that softmax. So doing decoding, we um, we don't. If we do it the simplest way possible, we always pick the most pro possible word. So the highest number in that softmax, that's the po most possible word that we pick, and uh, that's then our output word. For that, we're going to look up the word embedding, and then we can compute the next word prediction. Okay, so here's the output word that we want to predict, um, and we're going to base this off the softmax. So here's just a short snapshot of the output vocabulary, and by the color is indicated how likely here for this particular made up scenario certain word predictions are, and uh, the most likely word prediction is the. Uh, this is also word predict likely word prediction, and these and there. But then other words like cat or fish and dog are not very likely. So the most likely one here is the. So um, this is probably what we're going to take as a, as a good candidate for the word we want to predict um, in this particular stage of the translation process. OK, so we have this distribution of our word predictions and uh, let's say we pick one particular word. Um, the way we're going to build this now is similar to decoding in statistical machine translation is that we're going to create a translation hypothesis that says here is the word the that was being produced last and we can tie it to previous um, word prediction previous hypothesis. You're going to basically set up a similar decoding structure uh, you have hypothesis starting with an empty hypothesis at the beginning and then predict one word after the other. And here's the first word we predict. 
And as we have done in decoding for statistical machine translation, we might also consider alternatives because ultimately we are interested in the most likely path through uh, word predictions, not in always the single best word prediction for each word. So we want to have some kind of beam search where we consider multiple word choices. Okay, so we might also want to predict the word these here just to complete that. So once we have these hypotheses, we then have to make new predictions. Um, and these predictions are going to differ for each of these words. Keep in mind that we put in as conditional context to make the prediction the previous word. So this prediction here is conditioned on the embedding for the word the, and therefore it will be different than this prediction, which was conditioned partly on the embedding for the word this. So these are very different predictions. Um, they probably differ more for these because this implies plural and this implies singular. So that actually going to have very different word choices. The might be somewhere in between. So they will be all very different. So, and then we might pick a word from there. Maybe now here the word cat is the most likely word. Um, so that's a new hypothesis. And uh, there are various other hypotheses we can generate from that. And from there, we're going to make then uh, new predictions. Again, all these prediction vectors uh, will look very different from each other. So beam search, uh, we can basically do the same thing that we've done for beam search and statistical machine relation, where we say, well, we're just going to keep a certain number of hypotheses um, for some stack where we organize hypotheses together and the reasonable thing to do here is to go by how many words we have produced so these are all the hypotheses that have one word produced these are all hypotheses that have two words produced these are all hypotheses that have three words produced and we basically continue generating uh, new words until we hand, hit end of sentence token once we hit off the end of sentence token then the translation is done what is commonly done then is uh, we're going to reduce the size of the beam search by one because we have one complete translation. And we're going to keep running the other ones until they also hit end of sentence mark. As, and once the last hypothesis hit end of sentence mark, as we're done. So this gives us, by a beam size of six, uh, six different translations. So um, in difference to decoding in statistical machine translation, uh, we don't have any recombination here at all. Um, the things we had last in statistical machine translation where future decisions do not depend on some earlier decisions that are made in two different paths do not apply anymore. The, uh, the previous decisions uh, all have an impact on it. Um, in the computation graph, any prediction that happens further down is conditioned on all the previous word predictions. And unless you do something artificial by just kind of merging paths, if they are similar, um, you can't do any uh, recombination. So there's no clean way to do inter recombination, and typically this is not done. OK, um, so you have now uh, six different translations, and one of them is going to have the highest path probability. So this is the product of all these word pro probabilities may be normalized by the length of the sentence. And uh, then one of them uh, looks the best. And let's just say here in this example, this is the one that looked the best, that had the highest score. And then we follow all the previous decisions back from there. So um, some details to beam search. Um, so the what's commonly done is to normalize the score by length to uh, not penalize translations that are longer. Otherwise, the model is going to strongly prefer translations that are really short because they only produce a few words. So there are only a few numbers that get multiplied. Uh, so to have some kind of chance to give reasonable length translations high scores, we do that. 
Um, there's no recombination possible. The paths cannot be merged. So here's a very interesting picture that's worth staring at for quite a while. So this is for an actual real existing model translating a reasonably long sentence and it displays what the probabilities are for the different word choices. So it starts here with ich glaube aber auch which is already kind of an interesting German construction because it has this word for also that is in a very different place than where it would be for English also the word aber here is the word that actually means but and that's also in a different position than where for English so that makes actually the prediction of the very first word somewhat ambiguous um, so there is this aber in there so there must be some contra contradiction somewhere in that sentence and in English, the best place to do this is, at the, is, is at, as the first word. So that's why but here is with 42% uh, the best choice. And however is uh, the second best choice, which really means the same thing. They're semantically recurred. So that together is 67% of the probability. But there are also other choices. Um, one is to just start the sentence with I, which is the translation for ich. So that then has to deal with this uh, contrast in some other way. Yet is a, also a synonym for a but then however, but it's definitely a more rarely used. Uh, there's and here, which probably is triggered by this auch, which we later gonna translate more like more as also, and nor is another way to make a contradiction and uh, um, but it's not really working in this sentence very well okay um, so let's say we basically stick to this prediction for for but uh, for the first words but what are the next word predictions then so um, then the next word, uh, the model is fairly certain that it should be I, 80%. And then there are other choices, but also uh, that's uh, in English a bit clumsy to put those two next to each other. Uh, comma, but comma, that's a bit of odd construction. So all these are not all that reasonable. It is definitely completely wrong. So it's still pretty, it's actually pretty certain there. So the next word then it comes up with also, um, that's 85%, it's even more certain. certain. Um, the other options are think, belief, which would ignoring this word here, auch, that we have to put in there somehow. But once it has all these, then it has to come up with a verb and belief probably is not that high but think is the other one and both of them together add up to quite a lot 87 percent feel is another synonym uh, in for for belief or think or at least a closely related semantic word so it's definitely sure that should be a verb there and uh, belief is the one that goes it's the most likely one once you have all that, then you're basically done with this first clause here. Uh, ich glaube aber auch, which translates as, but I also believe. And then we can go to the subclause. And then here, it's, uh, there's no additional adverbs placed there or uh, discourse markers. So it just starts with a regular sentence and you start with the subject. And the subject here, he, the model is also very certain about. The only option was to put in a that there. I also believe that you could do that too. Okay, um, then he, next word is, uh, second choice is the contracted form of is. Uh, both of these together are almost 100%, um, like 97 percent almost over 97 percent once it's with that once it goes with that uh, the next word is clever which interestingly in german is the same word it's just a loan word from english that's being used there 
it has a more distinct meaning in English, in German than in English. The synonym smart is the other one. And enough, the model now is super certain. That's the translation of Genug here. And so on. Um, so the things worth pointing out to is that the model is often very, very certain here. The next one is 95.5%. And you see a lot of 90% in there. Um, and when it is not clear, uh, it often has um, uh, fairly synonymous words that it can pick on. Or it is not clear about how to put in additional function words like commas or the word that um, when it creates subclauses. Um, here is the only one where, where there's really some confusion about which verb should go there. It's pretty clear that the verb should go there, but there seems to be some long tail about possible word choices there. Um, interesting here is interpret in different ways. In, once it commits to indifferent, then ways is totally certain. So one has, has, has these kind of standardized phrases. Things go pretty fluent. Okay, so this is quite interesting. Um, so when I saw that first uh, in neural machine translation models, I was actually quite surprised how certain the model is. Um, if you compare this to a statistical machine translation, the models and statistic machine translation are never that certain. The prediction come out of probability distributions and those are uh, much less uh, peaked than these kind of uh, predictions here. Okay, um, that was already kind of the core of the decoding algorithm. So there's not really that much interesting to say since you can't do recombination. It, it heavily limits what you can do and kind of making it more efficient. And uh, we'll now look at a bunch of additional aspects or variants of decoding and um, how you would want to do decoding in maybe different contexts. The first one is this idea of assembling. So you can train multiple models that will all differ in interesting little ways. So one way to do this is to just start out with additional, with a different random initialization and then train. And all these models are gonna converge in different amounts of times to different endpoints. So some are gonna take, train longer and come up with a certain endpoint of parameters and some are going to be faster. This is obviously fairly expensive because you have to run it four times, but uh, if you have the compute, why not? Uh, in practice, assembling, having multiple models and then combining them is one of the sure bets in machine learning to give you better performance. Another cheaper way to do and uh, get multiple models to ensemble is uh, to just train a model once, but then take uh, different uh, model dumps, or sometimes also called checkpoints, uh, from a single run and then combine these. Okay, so here is um, how we decoded with a single model. So we had uh, the model making a prediction for additional for an additional word. So it predicted the word the here and then adds words after that. And now if you have multi-models, um, well, if you just feed it the same uh, previous words or at the beginning, let it make its word first word prediction, each of these models is gonna have a different probability distribution over output words. So one very easy way to combine these four models is to just take the average of these predictions. So we're just going to take the average of these predictions, and then that is our final prediction about what the next word should be. So um, this kind of assembling is a surprisingly reliable method in machine learning. There's a long history behind this, a lot of variants as machine learning ideas and algorithms motivated by this, something called bagging, for instance, um, model averaging, system combination, it's a panel of experts. There's a lot of names and uh, uh, the ideas derived from that. Um, I think the best explanation why this works, um, why do you have four models 
and have them agree with each other or make predictions together why is it better than one model and if that's the case why can't you just train one model that is as smart as these four models together um, I think that one good intuition behind it is each of these models makes some errors and these errors are going to be random and they're going to be different for each model so once they agree then that's probably more likely to be the correct decision another metaphor is this is how democracy works we don't ask a random person on the street uh, what decisions the government should make we ask the entire population and uh, they come up then with solutions that are probably better than asking different random people on the street each time okay another uh, common technique applied to inference is uh, re-ranking so there's actually something that happens after inference so we have to make the model make prediction and then we say can we consult additional knowledge sources to come up with better decisions maybe we want to also score sentences with a language model maybe uh, we have other kind of constraints we can apply after once we have translations in there and score the translations for that um, here's for instance one idea um, so we build a new machine translation model that translates words left to right so the cat is in the bag but we could also create a machine translation model that translates words right to left. So we're basically just going to reverse all the training data. All the training data now starts with the end of the sentence and the word before the end of the sentence and then the word before the sentence, end of the sentence. And uh, we could do this. We definitely have to do this on the target side. And probably we should also do this on the source side, but we don't have to. Um, and then we make that have that model make predictions so the motivation for that is that all the path dependencies that we have in predicting the next word in this model go this way so that the word back is being used here is informed by the word cat but if we start translating this way then the word cat here is also conditioned on the word back so this is something we didn't have before before cat was uh, produced without knowing what the future words are and here we can produce the words in the other direction so the future looks differently so um, this is uh, one way of decoding that gives you a probability for this translation is another way of decoding this gives you a probability of the translation so we now have two different ways of scoring things and uh, we can combine them uh, we can't do this by assembling because we can't we don't construct the sentence in the same order anymore we can really just start scoring with this model once we are done with it so this only can be done in a re-ranking stage so the idea is to train both a left to right and a right to left model and then we score the sentences with both so we generate sentences with a left to right model and um, take note of that score that comes out of that and then we take the sentence that we now have on place and just score it with a right to left model which gives us the other score so um, so the only way we combine these two models is once the full sentence is produced so once we have the full sentence then we can score it with the other model so this is, means we can only do re-ranking with that so a bit more detail on how to do this is we generate an end best list with the left to right model so we're gonna say here are the top 10 translations so this requires beam search with a beam size of at least 10 and then we score the candidates these 10 candidates for instance with the right to left model too and then choose translations with the best average score um, another way to look at that another idea is to do inverse decoding so one thing we spent quite a lot of time on dwelling over in statistical machine translation was the Bayes rule which reformulated the task that we actually want to do given an input x what's the like most likely output y uh, instead of uh, just trying to solve this problem here we reformulated it as uh, some normalization that we then throw away um, 
multiple and then the product of the translation in the other direction and the probability of y by itself um, if you recall that this is our language model and this is our translation model so one is the language model that can be trained on large amounts of monolingual data um, and uh, it could also already be added to ensemble decoding so we could also just already throw a language model into decoding um, with uh, our traditional ways of doing decoding and uh, then the other one is the translation model so this is now the other way around and this one is something we can not use already in decoding when we decode first in this way because it requires that the entire input sentence is available so we need uh, the, the entire output words sorry the entire output sequence is available um, to be then be able to produce new scores in the other direction so this is something that we can only use in a re-rank. Uh, how do we get this model? Well, this is really just a model trained in the reverse language direction. So if we have a German-English model, we would first train the German-English model. And then for this inverse translation model, we also need an English to German translation model. So, um, so we have now already some ideas about how several models might provide a score. Um, we have the regular translation model, we have this inverse model, we have a right to left model, we have a language model. So each of them is providing some scores and these scores could be added up. So if they lock scores, you can just add them up. So um, typically what is working better is we can weight these scores somehow in saying, for instance, the regular translation model is probably the most reliable. The inverse translation model is also useful. And the language model is going to have some weight. And it's very hard to say what these weights are. Um, but the idea is to come up with some number where you say this is trusted 0 0.4, this is trusted 0 0.3, this is trusted 0 0.2, and this is trusted 0 0.2. Uh, one and two, one point two. So where do we get these numbers from? So this can be set up as a, a, a task to train a re-ranker. So we have um, the training input sentences um, that gives us a base model that produces an invest list. So now we have an invest list of translations. So here we just use, for instance, the regular uh, forward model. So this is now an invest list of translations. We also know what the uh, reference translation for that should be. And we can now also compute these additional features because we now have input and output for a bunch of sentences. Uh, so we can now compute all these additional features. So we know what the right one is. So we know which one should which one of these and best should be scored higher than the others. This gives us therefore labeled training data and we can learn a re-ranker. And then at test time, we basically do the same process of having the initial baseline model uh, produce an and best list, have the additional features, and now we can then re-rank this and best list and come up with a best different top translation. Um, so there's various ways you could learn these re-ranking weights. Um, there's a method called minimum error rate training that was incredibly popular in statistical machine translation, which um, optimized one weight at a time by leaving the others constant and then checks different values that can be given to that weight and see which translations and best list pop up higher. So you just have basically the best lists for um, a tuning set of maybe a few thousand sentences around and just say, if I change one of these weights, which translations pop up uh, on top now differently. And then um, uh, this can actually be done exhaustively. So you, because there are only a limited number of threshold values where a change in the weight is actually causing a different translation to come on, on top in one of these invest lists for these uh, thousands of uh, tuning sets sentences 
Another method that became popular uh, was pairwise ranked optimization. Um, so this uh, basically um, also framed this as a learning problem that you can learn, learn weights for the different features. So let's go through that in some detail. So for each sentence in the tuning set, so again, you have a few thousand sentences of tuning sets where you also know the reference translation about what the translation should be. You also have a, a translations and best lists. And you can basically then look at two different translations in the embed lists for a particular sentence. Check which one is a better translation, leaving everything else fixed, and then train, create a training example where we just look at the difference in the feature values between these two uh, translations. So one might have a higher language model score, the other one might have a higher regular translation model score, the other one might have a higher inverse translation model score, one might have a higher uh, left to right translation model score. So you have basically the differences in feature values. So these are now the scores for these different models. And uh, basically then say, oh, if translation one is better than translation two. So if translation one is translation better than translation two, we say this is an example for better, this different in feature um, it should rank better and uh, if, if you have different different features and then the second translation is better then then that would be worse and that gives us now perfect training data to just train a classifier if you have the set of feature values and we have a prediction pattern worse to do and once you run this on uh, using a linear classifier this actually directly learns the weights for each feature this has not really explored much in neural machine translation. So this is actually an interesting challenge why um, these kind of re-ranking methods haven't really caught up yet much in uh, neural machine translation. Um, uh, this is a slide I already kind of had out there years ago and there has been a little work on it, but still there hasn't been that much work on it. So it's still kind of an open challenge how much you can get out of this. So one problem maybe is um, there's a certain lack of diversity in neural machine translation. So we don't have a nice um, recombination in beam search that gives us a whole decoding lattice from which we can then mine a lot of different translations. Um, here's an example from, again, a, a real machine translation model producing translations. Um, this is the German sentence. Uh, it's not so interesting what that means, uh, but if you just look at the different translations, he never wanted to participate in any kind of confrontation. He never wanted to take part in any kind of confrontation. So one thing you notice is all of the sentences translated with start with he never. There's only two examples where the the verb is then not wanted but intended, and then it kind of goes through these. Yeah, it should be confrontation or argument, controversy is the other word choice uh, in any kind of, in any sort of is the variation here to participate, to take part. So the beginning is uh, very similar. And then at the end, it kind of goes th through different word choices. But for instance, all of them have exactly the same word order. And if you have longer sentences, you even more see the phenomena that the beginning of all these translations in investors that we produce with just regular beam search are all the same. So there's, there are ways to increase diversity of NBEST list. Um, one is Monte Carlo decoding. So we're not going to do beam search. Um, so we're just going to have a beam size of one. So we always pick a word and just go with it and then run it on to the end. Except when we're selecting the words to extend the beam, we do not select the top choice. We not select the most probable words, but we randomly choose words based on their probability. Keep in mind that we had this probability distribution over words. So maybe the, you know, that was 0.8 and this was 0.1 and that was 0.05 and so on. And then we're going to have our random number generator come up with a number. And if it's a number like 77, um, so numbers between 0 and 100, we pick this one. 
but if it comes up with different numbers, if it comes up with numbers like um, 85, then it, it picks this word here. So we're going to pick this number here when the narrow number of generator comes up with numbers between 0 and 80, and we're going to pick this one if it comes up with 80 to 90, and so on. You get the idea. So a word that has a 10% probability has a 10% chance of being chosen. Another one is to extend regular beam search with a diversity bias term. So, uh, so we add a cost for extending a hypothesis based on the rank of word choice. So if you pick the most probable word, there's no cost. If you pick the second most probable word, there's an increased cost. There's the third most probable word, it costs even more. So we basically, um, just to, we have one hypothesis and we make predictions. So here, if it makes the most likely predictions, we're still fine. And But once we have the second more likely prediction, we're going to penalize them because we want to encourage the other hypothesis also in the beam to have some choice. So we want to rather uh, expand um, this hypothesis. So we rather want to have these two in here than um, uh, these two. So this is where we really then penalize stuff. OK, let's switch topics and um, move to constraint decoding. So this is a topic that has received some attention. Uh, it's mostly driven by very practical constraints on uh, using machine translation models in practice. So we might want to override the decisions of a decoder. Why won't we want to do this? We have a model and makes predictions. It's trained on data. Uh, it probably knows a lot. So why do we as human uh, uh, users of machine translation think we can we are smarter than the model and you want to override it. So here's some examples. So maybe we have an additional constraint to our model which says, okay, here is our best translation model we have, but uh, a customer that uses this also has a strict terminology that has to be followed that has a certain fixed word choices that just need to go in there. Think about it, um, for instance, technical user manual where a company has certain branded names for things and uh, then decides that these always have to be used. We can't use the competitor's terminology. We have to use our terminology and we have to be strict with it. Or it might also be a very specialized uh, domain where uh, words that have a common meaning in this particular domain have very particular meaning and you want to enforce the model, follow the strict terminology as well. Another thing is to do have some rule-based translation of dates and quantities. So maybe don't let the model figure out how to translate all the numbers and dates and quantities. Um, but we have a rule-based, perfectly fine rule-based translation system that translates dates, numbers, etc. Usually it's a good idea to let the model learn these things and with neural models it's actually much easier. But if you look at, for instance, uh, things like if you translate from uh, an American news story where they talk about the weather being 27 degree Fahrenheit and you want to translate that into pretty much any language in the world, you have to convert that into Celsius. And are you going to trust the neural machine translation model to come up with this calculation? Or do you rather come up with your magic rule that converts that? Um, another one is interactive translation prediction, um, which I'm not going to go into much further here. But uh, think about it as a tool that um, makes predictions for the next words. But uh, here we also have a user involved that might override these decisions at runtime. So this is like a tool for translators that use machine translation but uh, maybe you want to edit the output of the machine translation system. And then once they make an edit, they want the machine translation system to come back and saying, well, with this edit, what do you think the rest of the translation should be? Um, here's a, an example uh, that 
has an XML markup scheme that was popular in the Moses statistical machine translation model that we might also have envisioned for neural machine translation. So there's a couple of things going on here. I'm really just talking about the first part here where we say uh, the router, um, we say in the translation, this word has to be used. You can't just come up with the other words how to translate this word. Um, router is here used in the very technical sense of uh, a, a computer a networking device. And therefore, you're going to use the, the term, technical term for this um, computer networking device, while in any other language, the router might also have common meaning and then use a very different translation for it. Um, the other features uh, in this uh, markup scheme are saying walls that say you have to translate this part of the sentence, the first part of the sentence up to here uh, before you translate the rest of the sentence. So you kind of maintain sentence order. Um, and the zone here says that these, this uh, term here has to stay together. You can't just insert word there or spread it out to pieces. Okay, so so this is what happens during decoding. Normally, we kind of draw up this graph. So we translate here currently to German. So when there says der, der switch, der router, das Gerät, das router. So it comes also with all these word choices. And uh, if we have this as additional constraint, we can say, well, in these two examples here, we actually now satisfy the constraint. We produce that word. So uh, this seems to be on the right path. Well, here, well, it made word choices. Um, we don't have a clear link to the input anymore, so we can't just definitely say they're wrong, but they have definitely haven't satisfied the constraint yet. So, um, so these are hypotheses that have satisfied the constraint. So they are the ones that we actually, at the end, are uh, uh, gonna like. Um, while these here, who knows, maybe it's still going to produce the word router and then we're going to like it too, while this one might never produce the word router and then it's something we definitely don't like. So um, how do we keep this separate, uh, that some of these paths have already the constraint satisfied and others might satisfy it in future? So one way to do this is to put these in different beams. So you have separate beams based on how many constraints are satisfied here. There's only one constraint, so we have two beams, one where the constraint is satisfied and one where it hasn't been satisfied. So basically have one beam here that has the constraint not satisfied yet. And here's beam one where uh, the other beam that has the constraint satisfied. So this idea was proposed and called grid search because it has this a sequence of beams and each beam again has multiple hypotheses. So uh, if you have more than one constraint, you might end up with more than two beams. You have now uh, three beams here, one where none of the constraints are satisfied. Here are some of the constraints satisfied. And here are two of the constraints satisfied. And you see arrows always kind of moving downwards between the beams. So that's the only thing that can happen is that additional constraints are satisfied or no additional constraint is satisfied, but yeah, the number of constraints being satisfied can never be reduced. Of course, this uh, blows up the number of hypotheses you have, or if you stick to a fixed beam size, it then fragments the beam significantly. Another thing you might want to do in this is um, consider alignment. So it's not enough to check if the word is being produced, but was it produced actually as a translation for the input work that we marked up as the word that needs to be translated in a certain way. So it really should be a translation of the word router. So this is fine. Well, here it also produces the word router, but it somehow produces as a translation of this uh, particular router brand. Uh, product name. So this is something we probably don't want to have as much. This is something we prefer. So you could say uh, we actually pay attention to an input word and if it translates it correctly, we're happy with it. But if it translates it incorrectly, 
you can already see at this point that something's gone wrong there. So here's some ways how we could consider alignment uh, when satisfying constraints. So for instance, uh, when we produce a word um, that satisfy the constraints, we could say that a minimum amount of attention needs to be paid to the source word uh, that this output word is linked to. Or we could use the alignment score as an additional cost. And um, when we're not satisfying a constraint, we might want to block out attention to words that are not covered by the constraint. Um, one caveat behind all this is uh, where do we get the alignment from? Um, so the obvious choice is the attention mechanism in the neural translation models that we proposed. But it turns out that this attention mechanism is actually not as reliable as an indicator of word alignment as we might wish it to be. Um, but that's a topic we're actually going to cover in some future lecture on uh, both the challenges that are uh, posed by neural translation models and uh, methods that visualize and uh, models and make them interpretable. Okay, so we're here done for today. And uh, we now covered the core aspects of neural machine translation kind of had a long run into how uh, we built these neural models, how we built neural models in general, con uh, computation graphs, um, neural language models, neural translation models that emerge out of that, and now decoding. And this is actually already kind of the full kind of core take on neural machine translation. So the next lecture is going to cover uh, refinements of the approach we have right now. We actually also going to look at different architectures and uh, a few very essential things that actually make all this work. So uh, come back for that and that's it, that's it for today.